evening and welcome to our special off-season edition of Garden Hour, kicking us off for the fall season on um, this lovely rainy evening. Um, rainy for at least half the state anyways. My name is Christine Lang and I'm an SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist based in Brookings and I will be your host for this evening's show. At any point during the program, if you have questions for myself or any of our lovely panelists, please feel free to put that in the Q&A box and we'll address it after their session or in between or as, as we're able. And we definitely love and welcome questions. Um, joining me this evening, I have two state specialists. Presenting first this evening, we're going to be having Laura Edwards joining us from Aberdeen. Laura, what are you going to be talking about tonight? Well, we'll talk about the fall and winter outlook since we're late in the season here and about fall frost dates when we might first expect our first frost. All right. And I know we have some folks who are going to be anxious to hear about that. And joining us from Pierce, South Dakota tonight is our urban entomology specialist, Dr. Amanda Buckman. And Amanda, what's on the docket for tonight? Oh, as always, some uh, interesting insects that I've seen since the last garden hour, a little bit on the monarchs, uh, some reasons to keep spiders around, and maybe how to wrap your head around prepping for the fall insect invasion. Wonderful. That sounds like something we need to emotionally prepare for a little bit. <laughs> and I'll be rounding out garden hour probably piggybacking off of a lot of the information Laura is going to share about that fall outlook and what we should be pulling out of our garden and when. So without further ado, Laura, we're going to let you kick off the evening's program. Okay, great. Thanks, Christine. And uh, um, I'm going to talk about fall and winter outlook, as I said, and I'll try to zip through this. I um, have a few more slides and typical to show you some extra maps. So um, starting with um, the last month, um, last time I visited with you at Garden Hour was, I believe, uh, August 22nd or something like that, around the end of August. Um, in the last month, however, it's been quite warm, right? Uh, if you remember back to Labor Day weekend, we had temperatures in the 90, 100 degree range. Um, and then again, last weekend, kind of Book ends on the month of September with um, another round of very warm temperatures up in the 90s, especially in the eastern part of the state uh, just last weekend. And so no big surprise, everywhere across the state um, had temperatures warmer than average for the last month, really extending, you know, getting that garden, <laughs> th those growing degree days um, accumulated, uh, continued rapidly. Uh, we've been above average on growing degree days ever since probably like mid-May and never really fell back down. <laughs> and so um, I know this has pushed a lot of um, things fast through, through maturity um, given the warm temperatures. And so um, maybe things moved a little bit quicker than you were ready for um, here in the last month or so. But uh, as you see on the eastern side of the state, temperatures in some areas, Clark, um, Coddington County, a um, couple areas that um, Minor County, Minnehaha, six to eight degrees above average for the last month at some locations. Further west, farther west, closer towards normal, you know, maybe as much as two, three, maybe four degrees above average. So um, that's kind of been the story kind of towards the last part of the growing season. Moisture wise, kind of all over the board. Um, this is how um, different locations were compared to normal just again over the last 30 days. Um, green, blue, purple colors are above average. Uh, the warmer colors, oranges and reds, uh, drier than average. So the one area that seems pretty consistent is again around the Minnehaha County area. Um, you know, there's a, a, a multi-county area around there that's much drier than average. Um, many at uh, Sioux Falls, actually right there at the airport, had 51 hundredths of rain, just half an inch of rain in the month of September. That's almost two and a quarter inches below average, 2.22, I believe, um, inches below average for the month. So if you're from that area, um, I'm sure it's been pretty dry until right now. And oh, and I meant to say, by the way, if you're west of Sioux Falls right now watching this in like the Parker Freeman area, you're under tornado warning. So I hope you're not watching us from there. Um, 
again, a, a lot of areas wetter though. Um, you know, I, I've heard uh, in that Northern Hills area, Lawrence County, gosh, a lot, continued, continued rain events and a lot of hail as well this season. So um, really quite a, quite a bit of difference um, depending where you are around the state, but this is where we've been the last 30 days. First frost, that's been a lot of talk lately, and that's kind of the question I get now as we get into that mid to late September into October. A lot of, a lot of questions, when are we going to see a frost, you know, um, and, you know, debating whether you want to cover those tomatoes and, and have them go a little bit longer, or those other plants in your garden, um, keeping them going a little bit longer. Um, that's up to you. Um, but really, no one in the area has seen a frost yet. This is um, from the Midwest Regional Climate Center, looking at this season so far, um, those blue colors um, show show the date when those areas have had recorded a 32 degree temperature or colder. Um, but really, all of South Dakota is one little area up in the northern hill or up in the hills that has has had a, a freezing temperature, but no one else really in South Dakota has had that yet. So. Um, we'll keep an eye on this um, as, as the reports come in day to day. Um, our typical first fall 32 degree day, so this is the frost of 32 degree, I'll show a hard freeze of 28 degree in a little bit. Um, but the typical first frost occurs between mid-September up in the northwestern part of the state down to probably the second week in October down in that Charles Mix County area. So quite a range, really about over a course of a month um, are the typical frost dates. Um, so you can kind of look on the map and see where you are. Um, uh, as I know, you guys are all over the state. Um, but for most of us, we're already past where a typical first 32 degree day is. Um, so any of the purples and the yellow color, all October 1st or earlier, the greens you're starting to get into now, like October 2nd to, to 13th. So when are we going to see that? I think real soon. Um, you know, looking at the forecast here, this is for the low temperature Saturday morning. So, so basically Friday overnight, Saturday morning. Um, Looking at this is this is probably going to be our, our first frost here at Aberdeen. We're looking at 31, Rapid City 29 that morning. Pier right at 32, um, just south of the border. Valentine 28, um, Sioux Falls about 33, so right on the cusp of that. And so if you look to the north too, if you're in the northwestern part of the state, Bismarck's going to be 31. Um, so we're all right in that neighborhood of freezing or just barely sub-freezing. So what I expect is a low temperature will dip down, probably won't stay down that cold too long. Um, so um, maybe if you want to add a little extra longevity to your garden, you could possibly cover it up um, and, and save it for a little while longer. Um, I'll show you the outlook after that in a little bit. But this looks like our first frost will be Saturday morning. Um, we're looking at the possibility of the first 28 degree um, freeze, hard freeze. This is the typical, this is a map showing the typical date of which that occurs. Um, you know, for most of us it is in October. Again, the earliest dates are in the northwest corner of the state, usually the last week of September. They haven't seen that yet. Um, with the latest first 28 degree frost in the southeast corner, typically around the second to third, well, about the third week of October. So um, again, quite a range there. And I don't know that we're going to have a lot of areas report 28 degrees this weekend. Might, you know, again, that Rapid City in the Hills area might have a couple areas come pretty close. Um, but most of the rest of the state looks to be more in the 30s. Um, for that frost event on Saturday. As we look out ahead after that weekend, that's probably gonna be the coldest temperature of the weekend. Um, we're looking at a bounce back towards warmer temperatures. And this, this is why I'm saying where you can get a little extra life um, maybe out of your, out of your um, vegetable garden. 
looking at six to 10 days out on the left there, very high probability, um, pretty high confidence that we're gonna have warmer than average temperatures for the second week of October. That's the week of October 9th, or the days of October 9th, 9th to 13th. Along with that, um, generally drier than average, especially on the eastern side of the state, um, central and west closer to near normal chances of precipitation in that same window. So um, again, I think we're gonna see a, a bounce back to warmer temperatures. Similar, looking out even a little bit further, eight to 14 days out, still looking at warmer than average temperatures here over the north central states. Might see some more chances of rainfall in that same period though, especially if you're in the western side of South Dakota. That's what the map on the, on the right is showing, and slightly favoring towards wetter. Um, not very high confidence on the precipitation outlook at this point. That would bring us through October 17th, so very close to pheasant opener, right? I'm pheasant hunting opener. I looked at the hazards map for the th next three to seven days, and the one hazard they're showing here is the frost freeze potential um, for Friday night into Saturday all across this region. Again, we're all we're going to be very close um, to that freezing level. Not unusual this time of year, of course. Um, but they are indicating the first frost likely um, for much of us here uh, this weekend. When I looked at some hazard maps, uh, also looking out eight to 14 days, you know, it's kind of reaching out there. Didn't see much else. And especially risk of heavy snow, no snow happening. So, you know, we we're gonna get to freezing temperatures, but we're not gonna see snow. So um, not heavy snow anyway, so. We get a little ways yet till we look at the snow hazards. All right, so some hot information that just came out over the weekend is the October outlook uh, that was updated on Saturday. And certainly looking at the first couple of weeks of the month, as I just showed you, the six to 10 and eight to 14 days, like those windows of time indicating warmer than average temperatures here in our region. Certainly, they leaned heavy on that in the outlook for October, so you see that reflected there on the left. On the right, um, the later we get into the month, around the third to fourth week of the month, we do see uh, some more chances, more likelihood of some more rain events. And so they are leaning a little bit on the wetter side in western, central South Dakota, um, focusing more on the middle to later part of October. As we look out further ahead for the rest of the year, the next three months and overall, the October through December timeframe, there's a little more, I'll say maybe a lot more uncertainty as we get deeper into November, December. And so on the left, you see really no, no indication on the temperature side as far as warmer or cooler or near average, um, just not a lot of confidence in the kind of that transition season to the winter pattern. And similar on precipitation, again, the, the middle later part of October kind of leans a little bit wetter, but after that, nothing really is consistent in the outlook for November and December at this point. So um, again, equal chances are indicated for, for our area, equal chances of wetter, drier, or near average for rainfall for the next three months in general. So. Um, Again, I think we'll have a little bonus time if you cover your plants this weekend. Um, otherwise, we're just at a typical, kind of a little bit later than usual frost, frost date um, for the season. As we look out further ahead, um, since this is our webinar and, and, and uh, for the next two months, we won't see you for a little while. So we'll take a peek out at the winter in early next year. So this is looking at January through March of 2024. And we see a pretty strong El Nino in play. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll see strong impacts here, but the ocean is really strongly behaving like an El Nino pattern. What that typically means for us though, is warmer than average temperatures in the winter. So remember I said November, December, we're not seeing anything really strong on temperature or precipitation. But as we look further deeper into the winter um, 
and into March. We do see indication of warmer than average temperatures um, in the north central states here. And doesn't tell us a lot about precipitation either. Um, maybe the northern part of the state might might lean a little bit drier, but not a lot of confidence right now. So stay tuned for more on that um, as um, this information is updated every month on the third Thursday. So um, we just keep getting updates once every month on this. Um, just wanted to share um, a couple updates here from uh, the Mesonet. Um, and I share this a lot of times for real-time weather, looking at soil temperatures, um, soil moisture, winds, rainfall, all that kind of stuff. Um, I encourage you to check out the Mesonet, our weather station network with SDSU. Um, since I visited with you last in, in August, last time I visited with you, they've installed six more weather stations. And so the map <laughs> keeps changing on me. And I put the list on the right there, two, two stations in Hardin County. Um, Prairie City in Perkins County, Clark, Midland, and Spearfish all have uh, shiny new Mesonet stations out there. So I encourage you to check out those, um, that website, bookmark your favorite weather station, and, um, and check it out there. So I think that's all I have there to share with everybody. So thank you for your time today, and I hope you guys have had a great season. And um, I see there's a couple questions. Oh, just some links. So, yeah, right. I was going to say, I wanted to call out for everyone. I did drop a link to the frost freeze map as well as the Mesonet website. And I want to give folks a chance if you have any questions or curiosities for Laura. So, Laura, is it safe to assume that me and my students might see a few less snow days on campus this winter compared to last winter? I, I, I think so. It's kind of hard to be. I think last year there were seven or eight maybe. there was a ridiculous number of yeah. snow days last year <laughs> I know my <laughs> my kids in Aberdeen had 13 at the school district so yeah there were quite a lot of snow days last I don't anticipate that much snow all right um, and not as much cold either so parents and grandparents are probably like ah or indifferent or relieved and any kids who are listening are like oh man <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, if folks think of questions for Laura, don't be afraid to drop them in the Q&A. Laura's going to hang out with us. And we're going to transition to hearing from Amanda Bachman and getting an entomology update. All right. I've got my screen sharing. Perfect. Yeah, I wanted to start out with the monarch migration. Right after uh, the regular season of Garden Hour ended, we had Insect Fest in early September in Brookings, and there were tons of monarchs around during Insect Fest, and we also had monarch tags. So you can see the picture on the right there is a monarch that we tagged. It was great having the kids uh, catch the insects for me, and then I put the stickers on them and wrote down the data. Uh, but monarch tagging is essentially a giant uh, mark recapture study. So each of those little stickers has a unique number on it. And when they survey the monarchs sort of along the migration route and then also in the overwintering site in Mexico, if they pick up any monarchs that have been tagged, they can go back to that data and see, you know, where they were at what time during the fall. So it gives um, you know, conservationists, researchers, entomologists, a little bit more of an idea of where monarch butterflies go on the migration, how long it takes them, and then sometimes how successful they're being. Um, so uh, they're a great reason to have those fall flowers out. Uh, some of my pots of annuals are still going, so I think I might be putting them in the garage on Friday night so that they last maybe a little bit longer. But uh, I was outside yesterday. It's been pretty warm here in Pier, and uh, no giant line of thunderstorms heading my way, so it's probably safe for me to be the host on this. But the monarchs were still around in town. I think a lot of these are ones that were sort of locally produced. Uh, you know, chrysalises that since we've had such a long, uh, long summer, long fall, that they were able to complete their reproduction, chrysalises were emerging, and we've got some shiny new monarchs that are on their way to Mexico, and they need some of that nectar in order to get there. So any of your fall flowers that you still have out, any of those annuals that are still hanging on, even sometimes mums they will maybe feed on, but the native asters are even better. 
Um, but keep an eye on those plants and maybe see how long you can get them to last so that these straggling butterflies can have enough energy to make it south. I've also been seeing a lot of pictures from uh, people on my social media feeds of spiders that are out and about. There are a lot of the orb weaver spiders that are hanging out on people's porches, uh, by their back doors, uh, around garages, in their gardens. Um, this one was uh, here in Pier, um, down on the way to the Legion. Um, you can see in the web, like all those little tiny dots, those are all insects that the spider had caught in its web. Um, so I am very much an advocate for letting the spiders do their thing. These orb weavers just want to hang out outside. They are not a spider that is any in any way of, you know, human health importance. Um, spiders are going to run away from you. They are not going to run towards you to bite you. So let the spiders hang out, enjoy their webs as a natural Halloween decoration. And um, you know you can appreciate all the work that they're doing catching some of those tiny little uh, maybe perhaps annoying insects or things like mosquitoes. So let the spiders do their thing outside. Don't squish them. If you need to, you can always rehome them. Um, you know, scoop them up and put them back on the uh, the brush pile or whatever if they're hanging out by your back door. But if you've got a light on at night, Spiders will absolutely hang out there to um, catch any of the insects that are sort of coming to the light and then, you know, falling or whatever. So uh, if you want to reduce the number of spiders um, around your house and also, you know, help some of the other wildlife, uh, make sure that you have your lights on a timer and maybe turn them off at night. Uh, that will also help to get rid of the spiders by your back door. And I did want to share uh, sort of my favorite fall flower right now. My sedum has been doing really, really well. Uh, this one is, um, it's kind of, it has, you know, pretty like succulent leaves. And I've found that it does great in the Pier South Dakota area. Um, some of the ones that I have actually came from Master Gardener plant sales. So thank you to all the Master Gardeners that grow and propagate perennials. They um, they just do really well, especially um, once they're established, even in sort of dry years, the sedum will hang on. It might be not be as big from year to year, but it is a really reliable fall bloomer. And you can kind of see on the left, I should have circled all the bees, but there are about three or four um, bumblebees hanging out in, um, in this picture um, on the blossoms. And then on the right, you can see we've got a green metallic bee and also a wasp. Um, you know, a big flower head with all these little tiny flowers and, um, you know, just lots of insects are enjoying the sedum um, this time of year. So if you need sort of an easy care perennial that's going to be adding some fall nectar sources, I would highly recommend uh, throwing sedum into your landscape design. And then I was thinking about how I could sort of reframe uh, some of my fall insect advice and it comes down to don't fight nature. You are not going to be able to change insect behavior. A lot of the questions that I get from people about like why are, you know, certain insects or other arthropods making it into, you know, into my house, it's like, well, it's just in their nature. They're looking for a place to overwinter. And so that's a thing that you're never going to be able to change about, you know, a multicolored Asian lady beetle or a Western conifer seed bug. They are going to do that thing. Uh, what you can change is sort of one, how you react to it, and two, what you do to prepare for it. So knowing that some of these critters are going to be making their way inside, I cannot stress enough, do the prep work, um, hit up your big buck big box store, get that 11% discount and, you know, check the weather stripping around your doors, fix your screens. Um, all those little tiny repairs uh, can go a long way towards stopping some of the larger critters. Um, if there's an area that you've had problems with before, maybe like a basement window situation, um, even just running a dehumidifier in the basement can sort of dry things out enough that things like millipedes, once they get inside, won't survive for very long. And then you can just brush up, you know, the dead arthropods or insects, you know, in a dustbin. And one thing also to realize is that you're never going to see all of the insects that enter your home. This might be a ter terrifying thought to somebody who doesn't like bugs very much, uh, but you're never going to know how many got in there. So every time you see more of them, don't assume that they are feeding and reproducing indoors. The vast majority of these critters that are coming in in the fall are just doing it to come in to hibernate. 
Uh, so like the multicolored Asian lady beetle, they're not going to be feeding and making more multicolored Asian lady beetles during the winter, but you might keep seeing them, especially as we get some of the more mild winter days, um, you know, as they get kind of fooled into thinking it's spring and time to go back outside. So just because you might keep seeing more insects, um, it does not mean they're fe feeding or reproducing indoors. Um, so it's very important to, you know, make sure you properly identify what you're looking at. We've got a couple of those fall insect articles up on the website in addition to our um, new flip publication about arthropods in homes and structures. Um, so I can give you an idea of what you're working with and you can always take a picture and send it to us. Um, but yeah, a lot of these critters, they're not gonna be feeding or reproducing indoors. So just because you see a bunch of them doesn't mean they're increasing their numbers. It just means that they snuck in in places where you weren't, weren't looking. Um, and the insects are gonna be active through the first couple of hard freezes. So even if we get down to say 33 here in Pier on Friday night, that is not going to do much to the insect population. Um, they are going to find, you know, a sheltered little microclimate, especially if that temperature is only at 33 for maybe an hour or two, that's not going to be enough to be lethal to a lot of our insects. So we are still going to see fall insect activity, um, probably most of the way through October. So, you know, you've got some time to do that prep work. If you're starting to see insects move in now, you know, take the time to identify them appropriately um, and just know that, you know, you can do a perimeter sort of home defense style treatment, you know, that makes a lot of people feel better, but I personally don't see much of a point in it as you're still going to have dead insects inside. Um, something like a millipede is going to die when it crosses that barrier, but it's also going to die when it gets inside because inside, it's going to dry out anyway. So um, I would say just, you know, sort of shore up your defenses, tighten up those screens, windows and doors. Um, and just kind of keep an eye out for places where they might be getting in. And, um, you know, still wear your repellent, watch out for those mosquitoes. We are still having West Nile virus cases. Um, and yeah, yeah, the, the insects are still gonna be active. The wasps are still gonna be kicking for another couple of weeks. So um, winter isn't quite here yet, which, you know, I am personally fine with. Um, I do like seeing my garden go a little bit longer and get a chance to hang out with, you know, some more insects before we get to like January. Um, but yeah, so those are, that's what I've got for you folks tonight. So I'm happy to take any questions. I was happy to see the orb weaver, Amanda. Um, <laughs> I saw one, I saw a beautiful one on a farm in pier last week when I was out there for fall conference. So that, that tracks. <laughs> yes, there, there have been a lot of, a lot of spider questions. <laughs> I can vouch for the prep work too. We did spray foam in our windows this year and we did not get like the black vine weevils in August mm -hmm. like we always do. And the attic flies are starting, or the Picture wing. Well, picture wing flies are starting, yep. but they're not not as bad as they were last year. So good advice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I love it when I hear from people. It's like, oh, we did this thing and it actually worked. I'm like, yes, yeah. awesome. And I, I have noticed the picture wing flies are like out and about outside. So I am starting to see them like outside where they belong. Uh, so they will they will probably be starting to move inside soon. All right. And for more, again, for more information on those household pets that pests, I did drop one of the articles from Amanda. Um, um, I guess I have pets on the brain because per usual, I do have a photo of my dog in tonight's presentation. So I'll be rounding us out. Laura gave us lots of great things to consider for weather and maybe what we should be doing with our gardens. Um, you know, if you're someone who is living in one of those areas where it's going to get down to 28 degrees, or if you love tropical plants like my roselle, which is a hibiscus um, type plant, or the elephant ears that I have, or those are those are two of the big ones I'm worried about. Um, potted zinnias, things like that. If you have tropical plants or things, tropical plants that were house plants, and you brought them out onto your patio or deck or somewhere in your garden for the summer season and treated them as an outdoor plant. That 32 degree warning, um, I would really think seriously about, am I gonna cover those up? Or in my case, I have a calendar reminder because I live and die by my calendar. I have a calendar reminder Wednesday night because I wanna be proactive 
I'm going to start moving a lot of my tropical plants indoors. So um, unless you're really good at knitting and want to give everyone a, a, a warm, fuzzy blanket, those tropical plants, you might want to start moving them in. And Amanda might want to expand on this advice with me after, after my presentation, but remember it doesn't hurt to quarantine those plants in a garage or a different room or a physically different space than the rest of your house plants. So you're not bringing even more, you know, pest problems indoors. I have a geranium that I really want to bring indoors. And earlier this year, I saw aphids on it. So uh, I've, I've been, been checking that plant carefully and it's probably going to sit in quarantine a little longer than the rest. Um, so that is something to think about for, you know, plants that have been indoor, outdoor, or things that you want to move indoors. Um, I'm also going to try something new this year. I may be transplanting a lot of my herbs out of my raised beds into pots so that they can take up residence in my kitchen and I can have some culinary produce a little bit longer into the season. So maybe something you want to consider. Um, you know, we'll be talking about bed flips in a minute, but if you're looking for some some tender greens, you know, maybe throw a little bit of arugula seed out in those empty patches where you're pulling things out or try a little bit of spinach. Might be a little late for radishes, maybe some little mustard greens. Um, but if you're someone who's looking for like a quick cut and go meal, you know, play around with some things this fall or again, start bringing those things indoors. Um, as we think about our veggies and their frost tolerance, my graduate team has been busy getting, get, you know, wrapping up projects. Um, our broccoli harvest just happens to be completed, although um, they would have done fine in uh, a hard frost. I have a student who's growing broccolini, which is a sprouting type of broccolini, so it's a longer bunch type. That is actually slightly less fro frost tolerant than the broccoli that we know and love. So, um, We've got a, a small frost cover on on those plants, and then I think they're going to be fine for uh, uh, you know the next couple of weeks. So look at this list. Um, if you want to dig deeper, Rhoda Burroughs has a full article on the fall frost tolerance of common vegetables, and I have a hunch that Amanda just shared it for me. Thank you, Amanda. Um, so as we look at those you know those cold temperatures for Friday headed into the weekend. The things that are not tolerant are on the list on the left. So if you've got beans that you, you want to pick, um, you know, if you still have cucumbers and you're not sick of cucumbers, go ahead and pick those. Any summer squash or zucchini, again, you're probably sick of it and you're like, let the cold weather take it. Um, pumpkins are, you know, very sensitive to freeze damage, actually. We you know, many of us know this, we love to leave our pumpkins out as decorations, but as we start getting those hard freezes, you'll notice that you go to pick that pumpkin up off of the porch after Halloween and it just melts and turns to mush. Um, that's because pumpkins actually are not frost tolerant. The reason there's an asterisk behind muskmelon, pumpkin, and tomatoes, those are three fruiting crops that if you want to go ahead and pick them, before a frost event, because you know you you have a hundred row foot of tomatoes, or you have a huge pumpkin patch, or what have you, um, if you want to go ahead and pick those things, muskmelons, pumpkins, and tomatoes will will continue to ripen in um, in indoors. So those are things that you can pick ahead of time. Potatoes, I know there was a farmer that I was visiting with today. They were going ahead and digging and getting all of the potatoes out. Um, winter squash, again, most of that should be ready by now. So go ahead, pick that, get it in if you're worried. Um, again, if you have, you know, one potted plant of tomatoes or a couple of tomato plants and you want to put a blanket over them to protect them from the frost, that's that's great too. It's it's going to be up to you. Are you, have you gotten what you need from that garden or do you want to, carry on a little bit longer. Um, blankets or old sheets or things made out of cloth tend to work better. If you're going to use plastic or tarp, it's better to make sure that that is suspended above the plant material, sealed at the ground, but it's not, you don't just have all of the leaves of the plant or the fruit of the plant touching that plastic because um, that cold tends to spread right through it. If you're going to use plastic or something like a tarp material, your goal is trapping a warm air pocket underneath. Whereas a blanket, 
that's providing some physical frost protection and trapping a little bit of warm air underneath. Um, a lot of our root crops uh, do not care. They're going to be totally fine through this weekend, um, or most of them are going to be totally fine. I should be careful in case anyone out in Rapid drops to like 26 degrees. Um, a lot of our um, brassica crops, things like cauliflower, kale, broccoli, cabbage, they are not going to care this weekend. And in fact, many of them are very frost hardy and are going to do well into later in the season. I have a student who is growing cabbage at the Southeast farm, and we expect that her last cabbage harvest might be into November, very, very early November. Um, and some crops actually do better after several freeze thaw events. Brussels sprouts get sweeter, parsnips get sweeter, and horseradish, although I can't speak much on horseradish. I don't eat it because I'm a spicy wimp. Um, but horseradish, the flavor does actually improve with several free saw events as well. So just some things to consider, again, based on what you want to maybe bring in or what you want to leave out. If you're someone who's going to bring on all of those tomatoes, which I'm probably going to pick most everything and then let the weather have its way with the last two tomato plants in my garden, um, the last two tomatoes I have out are Bonanza, and they have been a beautiful red slicing tomato, and that was a South Dakota introduction, if you think way back to one of my first garden hours in May. Um, so I've been pulling out, pulling in tomatoes. If you have green tomatoes, there's this misconception that we need to set them in the sun to ripen. Don't do that. Um, it actually will cause any rots or molds or any surface blemishes, anything that's gonna make that produce go bad quicker, the sun is gonna speed that up. Don't need sun to ripen. All we need is the tomatoes, put them in a container, a box. I tend to wrap mine in newspaper and put a few red tomatoes in there so you get a little bit more ethylene production. And ethylene is what causes that ripening so that we can go from that green to that red. And then you just need patience. So I have a plastic container with a layer of newspaper and my tomatoes are two layers deep just sitting on my kitchen counter. I have it sitting there so I can actually remember to check it every few days. And as tomatoes get ripe, we've been pulling them out and using them. I, I have some that I'm keeping an eye on for roasting. So green tomatoes don't need sunlight to ripen. All right. So the fall flower beds, are we flipping it or are we forgetting it or doing something in between? Amanda, I'm feeling very guilty now about having my students harvest all of my zinnias tomorrow for my final cut flower harvest. To be fair, that's the whole purpose of those zinnias is to become bouquet flower bouquets. But if you have zinnias or cosmos or some of those other lovely blooming annuals that you can leave in the garden, you know, let the frost take what it's will. Um, and see what survives and leave it for the insects. I've been seeing a lot of monarch butterflies bopping around Brookings. This is a photo of our annual trial beds at McCrae Gardens. I know some of you have seen this or you've seen it on Garden Hour previously. We, I wrapped up my last trial evaluation yesterday and this is a case where this bed is going to be flipped. Not because we hate insects, there's lots of other places for them to bop around McCrae Gardens, but all of this is being pulled out and tilled and this is gonna be one of the sites for the tulip plantings. Um, so there's certainly still time to get your tulips in the ground, still time to get your garlic in the ground. So that might be an example where you do want to get the last of those vegetables or the last of those annual bedding plants out of the ground so you can make room for fall planting so you can enjoy spring bulbs. So that's one spot where you have permission to flip it. Um, where you might consider forgetting it, is anywhere where you have grasses or you know those fall blooming perennials that are still looking gorgeous. Um, I was just encouraging my sister who lives up in Moorhead, Minnesota, close to Fargo, you know, don't worry so much about the fall garden maintenance. She has an 18 month old. They just chopped down an apple tree. They're trying to get the leaves raked. Um, you know, they've got other things going on. I, I gave her permission, you know, go ahead, leave everything you have let it trap the snow, let it be an overwintering site for insects. And I now have promised her that I'm gonna help her with garden cleanup in the spring. So stay tuned, next May, there might be some photos from that. But just know, um, you know, if if something has disease, um, you know, if your peony had terrible powdery mildew, or if your 
phlox had terrible powdery mildew. Go ahead, cut those plants down to the ground because that is going to prevent some of that overwintering of those disease, you know, those structures that are going to cause disease again next year. But if the plants looked healthy and beautiful, let the frost take them, let them provide winter interest, let the birds pick at the seeds. Um, and, and don't feel like you need to have this big rush to mow everything down before winter. Um, while we are thinking about those perennial gardens, fall is a great time to divide perennials. We do still have um, a little window of time left to do this. For anything that we're going to divide in the fall, it's best to give that four to six weeks to take root into the soil before it freezes. So we're, Laura, Laura told me I could tell you early November. So if you're going to divide perennials, I'd probably make plans to do that this weekend at the latest for most places in South Dakota. Um, on the screen are some examples of things that do well divided in the fall. Missing from this list is daylilies. Daylilies, I think you could divide whenever you want. They really don't care. And most of us probably have too many daylilies. But if you have a beautiful daylily, um, you know, it's the rainbow daylily and you really want to propagate it, go ahead and do fall division. And I've got nice step-by-step -step instructions on how to do that on the extension website. And the photo on the right is just an example of hostas. And, you know, with anything that you're dividing, trying to get a clear picture of what's going on. Typically with dividing plants, you want to keep anywhere from three to five new healthy shoots. Um, you want to make sure that those roots are white or tan and, and clean and bright and not, you know, moldy or mushy or anything seeming to be wrong with them. Because if, if anything seems to be wrong with those roots or those rhizomes or those tubers, um, you're just spreading more disease around the garden. So making sure you're moving around healthy plant material is really the best way to go about that. Um, and there's some things that are going to do better divided in the spring. So feel free to wait. Um, a lot of our fall blooming perennials are really late fall blooming perennials. We actually want to go ahead and divide those in the spring. All right. Um, I, if, if you know me at all, you know that I love talking about cover crops and many of my graduate students are working on cover crop projects. Um, if any of you are excited to plant cover crops, I really, really appreciate the enthusiasm. I want to let you know that the window for doing it this fall is closing very quickly. Um, and the best way to see if that window is still open for you is to take advantage of the Midwest Cover Crops Council. They have a cover crop selector tool. When you go to this website, it is a row crop tool, but the dates the dates are very confusing you know, the, the dates of, you know, when we're going to have our frost freeze events and when seeds are going to establish correctly. I don't care if it's a 10 by 10 garden or a 10,000 by 10,000 acre farm field. The dates are the same. So go ahead and use this information. What's great about this tool is you can put in the state of South Dakota and you can put in your county. So the establishment dates I'm showing you right now, this is for Brookings. Um, and what we have left to work with is cereal rye. So if you're pulling your vegetable garden out and you want to cover that soil, prevent erosion, improve soil health, have something green that's going to be sucking up nitrogen and other nutrients during the spring rains, cereal rye is something that you can still plant. A lot of the other cover crops, I'm going to encourage you to wait until next year in um, late March or very early April at the absolute soonest. So again, um, opportunities for cover crops, but cereal rye is probably going to be your surest bet to get a green carpet over that vegetable garden as we head into winter. All right, and rounding out the show, um, if you are going around and you're pulling in a lot of those annual blooms, again, leave some for the insects, but if you're looking for something fun to do, maybe a fun fall craft with the kiddos or with the pets, although my dog Lola was less than impressed, um, maybe consider something fun like a flower crown. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a cut flower workshop in Sturgis last week, and I learned that making a flower crown is kind of putsy, but wasn't as intense as I thought it was going to be. So um, we had a green waxy floral tape wrapped around wire that made the, the crown itself. Um, we had greenery that we 
tied to, to our frame with wire. And then we had a heavy duty floral glue and we kind of picked whatever blooms we wanted and arranged them however we liked. So if you've spent time on Facebook or Instagram and seen all these glorious photos of people taking pictures wearing flower crowns um, and you're looking out at your garden going, what am I gonna do with all those flowers? Maybe maybe a fun craft to, fun craft to try. Remember, it's gonna be short lived because those flowers have no way of taking up water. So if you're making a flower crown for a friend and you're not going to see them for a couple of days, maybe store it in a plastic bag in the fridge to um, ensure the longevity of your flower crown. But just a fun idea. All right. Um, it wouldn't be a Christine Lang presentation if I didn't have an infomercial at the end. We have several awesome events left in the season. Um, first and fo foremost, if you have the opportunity to join us in Rapid City on October 16th and 17th, Rhoda Burroughs, myself, our colleagues from NDSU, and a bunch of farmers would love to see you there. We're going to have two whole days of education. We're going to have eight different presenters, so it's going to be research and farm experiences. On the 17th, we're going to load up on a charter bus and we are going to hit the road and tour two different farms to learn about their high chemical production systems. There will be lots of time for networking and we are going to have a local chef providing the lunches both days. That, and I'm very, I'm very excited about that. I'm excited about the entire thing. Um, I do want to share that this is a free registration ticketed event. So the cost is $25 per person per day and the registration is closing next Monday, October 9th. So we have time to update our caterer on how many lunches we need. So if you're interested in learning more about that event, please visit our website. You can see all of the presenters, the topics, the farm tour overviews, and um, you also have an option to pick one or both days. So if you can only join us for the tours on Tuesday, we'd still love to have you attend. Um, the next event I want to promote is the South Dakota Local Foods Conference, SDSU Extension. There's several of us specialists who are partnering on this event, and that is going to be November 17th and 18th. I realize I didn't put the date on here. Um, so that'll be November 17th and 18th, the weekend before Thanksgiving. And that is going to be held at the hub at Southeast Tech in Sioux Falls. So I'm providing you with a West River and an East River event. Um, again, this would be a great one if you have an opportunity to make a road trip to Sioux Falls, we'd love to have you. Um, there's gonna be a free, free conference social on the night of Thursday, November 16th. We're gonna have two awesome keynote speakers, Linda Black Elk and Nick Olson. Um, so we'll have Linda sharing her expertise as an ethnobotanist and an indigenous woman who is passionate about food sovereignty. And we're gonna have Nick Olson from the Land Stewardship Project out of Minnesota talking about farm beginnings program programming and providing a lot of advice for beginning farmers based on his his own experiences and those of helping others. Um, we'll have 15 plus sessions focused on all sorts of topics to support your farm, support the food system. And if you're just someone who loves local foods and loves being a consumer of foods, there is still going to be something for you. And if you have young people in your life, um, Anna Tweet and Sidonia Trio and others on the planning committee, have a dedicated set of youth activities, including lots of hands-on things to keep all of the kiddos busy on Saturday. So we would love to have you bring your kids and you can learn more about the South Dakota Local Foods Conference on our website. And you may remember hearing from some of our graduate students throughout the regular season of Garden Hour. I want to highlight that we have a new video series. Um, Alexis Barnes, Connor Rune, Jocelyn Faustert, and Hannah Voy each did a video about their research. And it's a great chance to see some more video footage from in the field, see some of the ways they collected the data, and get to learn more about those student projects. And it might just make a great podcast if you need to fill an hour or so as you're driving from point A to point B. So you can find that as well as all sorts of other cool videos on the SDSU Extension YouTube page. And with that, I'm gonna pause and ask if we have any questions, discussion. Amanda, any, any other advice you wanna add about garden cleanup and considering our insect friends? 
I'd say that if you are just possessed and absolutely must cut down the dried stalks of some of your plants, don't put them in the trash. Just like gently place them in the back like compost pile or something so that any bees that might be nesting in the stem for the winter uh, will survive the winter. Really the biggest thing is, you know, don't don't fill up those like lawn trash bags and send everything off to the landfill. Um, the more leaves and natural material that you can leave in your yard as habitat, um, the more the bees and butterflies will appreciate it. Exactly. And I guess that's a great, a great point too, when it comes to leaves, um, if you can, you know, mow with a mulching mower blade and be breaking up that leaf material and leaving it on your lawn, that's great organic material and some free fertilizer for your lawn. If, if the lawn, if the grass or the leaf pile is already a foot thick on your lawn, not so great for your lawn. You're probably going to suffocate and cause some disease issues, but could you rehome some of those leaves and put them over your perennial garden to help, you know, overwinter the rose bushes or mulch the garlic planting or mulch the tulip bed and provide homes for insects and provide adding or prevent adding more to the waste stream. So any anytime you can save yourself from having to rake up as many leaves just for the sake of raking them, I'm a huge fan of that. Of course, I say that as someone who currently lives in an apartment. So <laughs> maybe if I see them raking and begging the leaves, I'll run out and say, no, I'll put them on my deck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my front, like the maple tree, I, you know, rake those leaves and then they get put into the flower beds I have out front. So they they get taken off the grass uh, somewhat and used as natural mulch. Um, and then, yeah, they'll, a lot of times they'll do a lot of breakdown um, by the time spring rolls around. Excellent. Well, Amanda, Laura, any other parting words of wisdom as we round out this evening? You know, it's one thing that came to mind when you're talking about, you know, dividing plants, you know, on soil temperatures, the South Dakota Mesonet, the weather stations all have soil temperature on there at four inch depth. And so when you go to the homepage on that first map, just choose the option that says four inch bare soil temperature and you'll get the readings for the day for the moment. Um, you know, they're still in the 60s and 70s, so we got a ways to go. <laughs> yeah, some time. Um, but if we get like a string of days that are really cold, that's usually the first signal, you know, that's probably near the end of your time there. So, yeah. and also checking it in the spring again, you know, when you want to start gardening and start planting seeds and doing all that stuff, check those soil temperatures again, and um, that'll help you get your garden off to a good start. Awesome. All right. Well, I want to remind folks that um, just because you can't see us next week on Garden Hour doesn't mean you can't get a hold of us. Um, I have dropped in the website for our problems and solutions page for SDSU Extension. Our garden hotlines are going to be open through October 20th. So if you have questions or curiosities, feel free to call or email them and visit with them. After that time, we're going to have a slight pivot on our garden hotline. But know that we have our Ask Extension budget button, <laughs> and if you put questions in there, that goes typically straight to myself, Amanda Bachman, Rhoda Burrows, or John Ball, so we'll be happy to answer it. I apologize. There was a brilliant lightning strike that really distracted me for a moment, so <laughs> I think the storm is here, folks. Good timing. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I've got one question that snuck in. Um, yeah. The question is, any benefit to having box elder bugs? Uh, mm -hmm. And to which I say... Box elder bugs are neutral. Just let them do their thing. Um, they will come inside as adults. Oh, we have some here in the Pure Regional Center. Um, if I see them flying around in the winter, I catch them and throw them in the freezer and use them to teach kids how to pin insects. Because um, you can easily mess up on a box elder bug and you don't feel bad about it. But if you mess up on your beautiful Cecropia moth, you feel a little bit sad. Um, but I would also encourage folks to think about a lot of insects as being, uh, you know, neutral to humans. Like they're just out there living their lives and, you know, insulate your windows do the spray foam, uh, like Laura mentioned, and that will keep them from coming indoors because they are one of our more sizable, or not super sizable, but they're they're big-ish for our overwintering insects. Um, so it's pretty easy to stuff up those cracks and keep them from getting indoors. Awesome. And you know what? I think box elder bugs are kind of pretty. 
And I swear there was a gift shop somewhere back home that like the box elder bug was the poster child for their gift shop because that, that was like the name of the business. So just know someone out there loved box elder bugs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that, I think we're going to draw the evening to a close. Thank you so much for spending a rainy night with us. And I greatly appreciate you being here. And I want to remind everyone that the next time we gather will be December 5th. And I have a hunch that you'll get a chance to learn about poinsettias and Christmas trees. Not from me. I won't be on that one. But I know John Ball will be here. And I believe Rhoda Burroughs will be online. Amanda, are we going to see you at that one? Uh, probably not. <laughs> okay. All right. Amanda and I are going to take a Christmas break, but we'll see you again in the spring. Um, but we'd love to see you. Our colleagues would love to see you in December and feel free to spread the word and gather over a cup of hot cocoa for December garden hour. So with that, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful night, everybody.